Uh, welcome to our webinar, Hydrophilic Coding Trends, Coatings, Coaters, and Curing, designed to provide insight on the technology and techniques behind hydrophilic coding. I'm Rudy Altorfer, sales leader of BW Tech, based in Switzerland. Today, we have three experts with us to discuss ways and areas around coding, coders, and curing. Let's get started. David is a senior coding engineer from LVD Biotech. He has over 10 years of experience in medical device coatings and biopolymers. He's part of the R&D team, and the focus of his work lies on transferring the hydrophilic coating technology to customers. David, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for attending this webinar. I'm David from LBD Biotech. And today I'm going to talk about the new trends in the medical coating industry. First of all, I'm going to introduce a little bit uh, our company, LBD Biotech, who we are and what we do. And then I'm going to talk about some of uh, the new trends in, in the, the field of the coatings for medical devices. First of all, I'm going to talk about the particle release, a very important feature nowadays in the, in the coatings field. And secondly, I'm going to talk about the types of devices, substrates, geometries, and materials that can be coated with, with these hydrophilic coatings. And in the end, I'm going to talk about uh, the new trends in surface modification technologies, such as plasma treatment. Okay, LBD Biotech uh, is an innovative OEM company specialized in medical devices, more specifically uh, semi-finished bars, such as stents, uh, medical tubing, and also coatings, uh, hydrophilic coatings and, and drug diluting coatings. The, the more important thing that makes us different from other companies is that the, the vertical integration, okay, we design and manufacture all the raw materials, such as the polymers and the formulations used in our coatings. Okay. So, what we are looking for when, when we are looking for a hydrophilic coating? First thing, it's obvious, is the lubricity. Okay. We want uh, the, the coating to make the device lubricious in order to facilitate the, the access and the navigation through turtles fluid vessels, but it is also very, very important to control the particles that are released uh, from the coating to the bloodstream, okay? So it's very important that the coating is uh, durable, uh, it means that it doesn't release particles to the bloodstream, because uh, the, the, the particles, once are released to the, to the bloodstream, can lead to some diseases, for example, obstruction of some veins or arteries. Okay, so very important to control this feature. And so how we can control this? Okay, LBD has developed uh, a method for measuring the amount and the size of particles released by a device during its clinical use, using a tracking fixture, like for example, the one that you can see in the picture on the left, which imitates the, the artery system from the heart, okay? And at the end of this circuit, we place uh, a particle counter that counts the particles that are released from the device during its, its use and classify them by size, okay? This is done in real time during navigation and deployment of the device. So very important, this feature when choosing a uh, hydrophilic code, okay? Then second thing to Take in consideration when choosing an hydrophilic coating, the device itself. Okay, and by the device, I mean three things. Okay, one thing is the application, the clinical use of the device. Okay, it's not the same uh, uh, PTCA or PTA device than a neurology or an ophthalmology device. Uh, you are not looking for the same features, so very important that uh, the hydrophilic coating that you choose fits the features and what you are looking for for your device. The second thing is the material uh, of the device. It's not the same to coat plastics like polyurethanes or polyolefins or, or metals, for example, or silicones, 
it's not the same. So you need to make sure that the coating is suitable for, for your material. And the last thing to take in consideration is the geometry of the device. Okay, for example, it's not the same coating a balloon or a tubing than a, a guide wire, for example, that have a coil type structure, or for example, an ophthalmology cartridge that has a very, very complex geometry and have to be coated on the inside. It's very difficult for the UV light to reach these, these parts. But uh, there are solutions for this type of, of, of applications. For example, Bella Technologies that offers uh, a 3D UV curing system that allows to coach uh, complex geometries like this one. Okay, so very important uh, to take in consideration these things uh, when choosing a, an hydrophilic coating. Then I tried um, several different formulations different coatings, different uh, coating processes, different uh, machines, but nothing works. Um, does, do I have a, an alternative? Do I have an, an option? Yes. Uh, for example, plasma technology. Uh, that, uh, what, first of all, what is plasma? Oh, plasma, it's, uh, it's, called also, it's called also the fourth state of pattern, and it's mainly ionized gas, okay, and also some spe reactive species and how it works. This ionized gas and reactive species can react with the surface of the, of the substrate uh, in different ways when depending on the, the, the gas that you're using or the process parameters that, that you use. Okay? Uh, one thing that you can do is clean the surface. Sometimes you have contaminations in the surface that uh, makes it impossible for the coating to, to have addition of these, of these substrates, and you can clean the surface using plasma. Second thing that you can do is activate the surface. Some surfaces, like for example, silicones or PTFA, PTFA are substrates uh, with a very low surface energy and needs a, use activation of the surface prior to uh, apply the, the coating, because if not, you won't have addition. Then you have also other processes that can be done with plasma, for example, etching or even coating. Ultra thin coating, ultra thin coatings can be performed using plasma technology. For example, uh, examples of materials that uh, that are most commonly plasma treated are plastics like, for example, PIG or PTFA or polypropylene that are materials with very low surface energy. Or, for example, metals, glass, and ceramics. Okay, so if uh, there are options uh, to treat the surface in order to uh, add uh, a coating to your substrate when it's a difficult one. Okay, so uh, that's all I wanted uh, to say today. Thanks for attending the webinar. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, now let's take some questions. So one question that came in, Dave, is what is the standard coding process time? Well, the standard coding process time is uh, around between five and 15 minutes, depending on the, on the coding length of the device, okay? because the process is based on, on a dipping process first. So the dipping process takes uh, longer if the, if the device is longer. And the curing time, depending on the thickness of the coating applied, it would be between uh, 30 seconds and maybe two minutes, something like this. So the standard coating process is around uh, between five and 15 minutes. So it's uh, a very fast process compared to other other uh, other methods like like heat curing. So yeah, that's the standard standard process time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Another question that uh, I want to ask you is, what is the shelf life of the coding solution and do customers need to premix the solution? Well, the, the, the coding solutions are ready to use. Uh, there's no premixing needed before, so you can use it straight away in your machine. And the shelf life of the bottle uh, unopened is up uh, to three years. Three years. That's a long time. Appreciate it, Dave. Thank you so much.
Our next expert yeah. is Samuel, an accomplished application engineer at BW Tech. Since joining the company in 2015, he has been involved in numerous projects from their inception. With a strong background in manufacturing and medical, mechanical engineering, he thrives on finding simple yet effective solutions to complex problems. Thank you, Sam. Welcome to the Machine Solutions webinar on hydrophilic coating trends. Hi, my name is Samuel Troxler and I'm an Applications Engineer at VW Tech. I'm going to talk about the important considerations for dip coating equipment. To go forward in technology, we first need to see where we came from. We've done different types of coating machines in the past using different methods of applying the solution, spraying, dipping or sponges. From there, we have made the experience that spraying and sponge coating have the similar difficulties. With both systems, it's hard to tell how much solution is actually on the product and a lot of solution is just lost in the process. That's why we have focused on dip coating in recent years. One of the examples is the hydrophilic coating machine 2269. It's an all-in-one machine for a base coat top coat system, including the curing. Following, we're going to see a video with a quick introduction to the machine. It's just going to take a minute to start the video. This is the 2269 hydrophilic coating machine. It is made for up to 21 products with a coating length of 400 millimeters. It comes with a standard BWTEC HMI and includes two cameras on the inside for a view of the process. It is equipped with a barcode scanner and a UV measuring device. It also comes with a stand for the extra product trays for switch over. With the product trays, you are very quick in setting up a new batch. We take the empty one out, place it in the rack, take the new one, and put it in place. The machine is equipped with six UV lights for curing the coatings. On the coating side, there is always the option of having two different coatings, for example, a base coat and a top coat. As an option, there is also an infrared light bar available to pre-dry coatings which are water-based. The coatings are stored in stainless steel tubings to minimize the actual usage of coating solution. With the 2269 hydrophilic coating machine, you get an efficient machine to produce up to 21 products at a time with a coating length of up to 400 millimeters. The BWTEC HMI tracks and records your processes for the most reliable results. As mentioned before, you can do 21 products at a time. They're split into three cassettes with seven, with seven products each just for more ease of handling. The cassettes can be used with different holders depending on what kind of product you're doing. For example, you can have a magnet holder if you have assembly groups or you can, you can have lure or push-in connectors. The coating bath is done with a set of 21 tubes for a base and a top coat. They're also split in three parts just for ease of handling. So you can take the whole rack out if you want to change coats or if you want to clean it. The tubes are made from stainless steel and the end caps from PTFE. They're available in a 9 millimeter or 12 millimeter ID. They can also be disassembled easily for ease of cleaning. The core of the machine are the six UV lamps as seen on the bottom right image. 
they are encased in a separate room on the machine to make sure that we don't have a big heat transfer from the lamps to the products. To furthermore ensure that the products are not getting too warm, we have a temperature and a humidity probe within the machine. You can see this on the middle image on the top row. Those sensors will track your humidity and temperature during the process and also write it into the um, process data. On the left bottom image, you can see the infrared bar, which was mentioned in the video before, which can be um, added optionally if you have water-based codes. Lastly, we have a um, UV probe with every machine so that you can check if your lamps still have enough power to fulfill the requirements for your process. This is the HMI recipe overview. On the very bottom, you can see the defined ranges of temperature and humidity, which I was talking about before. So in, the, in this case, the temperature should be between 25 and 45 degrees C. If you exceed these ranges, you will get a warning. In the box above, the general settings for the processes are made. This includes, for example, if you want to use a base and a top coat or just one of them, how many runs you want to do, so dip it just once or more, and you also get a number where it will tell you when you have to check your tubes um, for a refill. Here are some more examples from the recipe creation, um, which options you have. To save on UV hours, you can specify which lamps should be used um, in the process. For example, if you do a, um, a development batch and just doing one rack at the time, you can just select two of the six lamps to save the others. As with other BW Tech HMIs, is the recipe step-based. That means within a recipe, you can have different steps to define your recipe. So for example, um, the first will dip 100 millimeters slow and then the rest in a, fast, in a faster speed. Lastly, a separate curing process is defined for each code. In this, in this example, there um, was also the option of uh, infrared lamps, so you can also set this for your um, codes. Now to the news we're all here for. The next generation of coating machines are being developed together with Velox 3D UV curing system. Here, the best of the two worlds are united. A robust design of a BW Tech machine with the real reliability and accuracy of a Vela 3D cure. Starting from the bottom, the proven system of curing bath will be continued. As a first, we started with a maxim maximum curing length of 500 millimeters, while 12 products are done in one cycle. The design of the bath will be the same and also available in a 9 millimeter and 12 millimeter ID. The machine is made for catheters up to um, 1,800 millimeters, which is a standard length. They will be loaded with a rack of 12 with the card you can see on the side. So it will be adjusted in height and then you can just move it in and it will put the whole rack in. As with the maximum dipping length, um, are these averages and other length or numbers can be realized on specific, on specifically on customer needs. After dipping, the curing will start right above the bath. Since the ther thermal influence from the Vela system is much less than with traditional lamps, we can be much closer together and don't need that much space. But this is just a convenience. The big leap forward is that Vela is, being, is able to measure the dose of UV um, rays we are giving to the system. So we're not just um, defining a time on how long we are curing them, we're actively measuring is the dose enough for our product to be um, to be cured. So there is no guesswork, it's just always the exact dose on your product. Also the rotation of the products is obsolete. With the, with the Vela Cure 3D chamber, it is not necessary to rotate, rotate the product since the beams are just scattered around and um, applied evenly. Thank you for your interest in this webinar, and we hope I hope we fi you find it educational. Thank you, Sam. 
That was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions for you from the audience. One question that came in is, can you quote coat products for longer than 500 millimeters? Hi, Rudy. I believe we're having an audio issue. Just give me one moment here. And while we're waiting for Samuel's audio to work, our apologies for that. We do test that in, a, in advance. Just a reminder, you can submit questions by typing your questions into the questions box on the GoToWebinar control panel. So why don't I jump in and answer the questions? Since I'm working for BW Tech, I should have enough uh, knowledge to answer that. Is that okay? I think that's great. Thank you, Rudy. Sure. Uh, again, we apologize. Let me repeat the question. Can you quote uh, products for longer than 500 millimeters? So our standard coding machine 2269 is the off-the-shelf machine. Uh, the, the length is 400 millimeter, but with the new concept, which Sam explained the combined machine, it's up to 500 millimeter as a standard. But we have built machines with coding length up to one meter. So coding and product length can be fitted to the customer needs. So please just approach us and we do also customize solutions. The next question from the audience that came in is, what is the typical process time or what is the reduction of an average process with Vela in percentage? So uh, again, that is of course the, the new product that we have on the market that we will launch and we will hear from the next speaker a bit more about Vela. Uh, but basically you can expect a 25 to 50% of reduction time uh, on the curing time with the combined BW Tech Vela Cure solution. So again, Thank you, Sam, for the presentation. We appreciate it. And uh, let's go to the next speaker. Let me introduce Mike. Mike is our next speaker. He's co-founder and VP of engineering at Vela Technologies. He has more than 30 years of experience working with UV for a variety of applications, including curing, sterilization, disinfection, lasers, and hazardous material abatement. Mike works closely with customers to provide the right curing system for their application. Thank you, Mike. Well, thanks, David, for that uh, illuminating talk on UV coatings and uh, the new technology there. Uh, this is Mike Ingram from Vela Technologies here to talk about uh, the curing aspect of UV coatings. Uh, Vela Technologies, we've been in business since 2006 um, and we're just recently acquired by Machine Solutions this year. Um, and we're focused entirely on uh, curing coatings and adhesives that are used in medical devices. And uh, today I'd like to talk about conventional curing technology. Um, you know, when you you have something new that Vela has in the market that's or in the market or a technology area that's been around for quite a while, it helps to explain what the current technology is and then what the new technology, how that improves on the conventional ways. So we'll talk about that first. And uh, conventional curing technology is what we call direct irradiation. And then after that, we'll contrast our new method with that, which we call diffuse irradiation, and uh, get into some of the benefits of that and how to integrate that into the coating machine. Uh, conventional curing is using direct irradiation. That means that the, the light or the UV that comes off the bulb is directly illuminating or, or landing on the catheters that are being cured. So basically, a, a, uh, uh, catheters are hung in front of the, the UV bulbs. 
UV bulbs are generally not as large or as long as the catheters are long. And so it will require a bank of bulbs, uh, a number of bulbs in order to directly illuminate uh, catheters that can be, you know, anywhere from a cure zone of a few inches to, uh, you know, 60 inches or more, um, or a couple meters or more. And uh, so to over overcome that problem, uh, they, they have to use a number of, of uh, lamps or bulbs to shine light directly on the catheters. But when you're doing that, you're shining the light from one direction. And so the backsides of the catheters see very little UV. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, curing machines will put uh, reflectors or mirrors on the back side of the catheters in an attempt to redirect the light. But that's really ineffective and it doesn't work. And uh, so what they have to do in this conventional method is rotate the catheters. So now we have a bank of, cat of lamps shining light directly on a bunch of catheters that are hanging in front of the lamps. And in order to get the backside irradiated, we have to rotate it. So now we may have, I don't know, 10 or 20 catheters hanging in front of uh, 10, 10 or 15 bulbs and the catheters are rotating to bring the backside to the front. What that does is creates a time dependent irradiation on the catheters. So the backside gets no light. And then as it is rotated around to the front, it gets the full illumination or full irradiation. And then it rotates back to the back where it gets none or very little. And um, the problem with that is what's happening is your, the, the chemical reaction is starting and stopping and starting and stopping. What creates the chemical reaction is the irradiation from the bulbs. And uh, so when the, the surface of the catheter that's facing the bulbs directly, uh, it, chemical reactions begin. The, the UV photons land on the, the, chemi the coating and begin the, the curing. But then when that catheter turns around, that surface area is now on the backside and it's seeing very little or no light. So the reactions are much diminished or stopped altogether. Uh, and then as the catheter comes back around and sees the bulb again, the, the reactions begin again. And that's what we call this time-dependent non-uniformity. Uh, and that starting and stopping that reaction is just a bad thing. Uh, you can think of it as creating stresses inside of the, uh, the finished product uh, because, you know, the, the Reactions that began and polymerizations that began stop and then they have to begin again. Uh, so it creates uh, stresses in the finished product. It's kind of like you know, I liken it to driving with your foot on the accelerator and the brake pedal at the same time. You're going and stopping, going and stopping, constantly bouncing back and forth. Same thing's happening with the coating. It starts and stops and it uh, creates a bad result. Another, another problem with doing it that way is that uh, it just takes a long time to do it. Uh, if you think about it, the unexposed portion of the catheter is facing away from the bulbs about 25% of the time. It's seeing absolutely no light or hardly any light. And then as it comes around, it gradually sees more light until it gets fully illuminated or irradiated, and then it turns around to the back and sees nothing. So we're spending a lot of time not curing. And that's kind of a bad thing in a, production, in a production environment. So, you know, the message is that it kind of works. It, it's been done this way for years, very long time, but it is just a mess. And all of these uh, technologies, the rotating catheters, the bank of lamps are all created or implemented in order to overcome the fundamental problem that they're shining light directly on the catheter. It's just the wrong thing to do. So the way Vela does it, of course, is the right thing, the right way to do it, is we do it with diffuse reflections. Now, uh, diffuse, a lot of people understand that, some don't. So a little primer on diffuse reflection, you can see in this uh, little graphic to the right, uh, light comes in to a surface, a reflector, and in the case of a mirror, it reflects at exactly the angle that it came in at. But in the case of a diffuse reflector, it reflects at all angles. So you see these rays of light that come in here, each of these individual rays 
are reflecting in every direction. So the viewer can see some light from each one of these reflections. Whereas in the case of a uh, specular or a mirror reflection, it would come in at an angle and come out at the same angle. And this viewer sitting here would not see this ray at all because it comes out at an angle that he can't see. This viewer here would be able to see this one because it comes out at basically the same angle. Diffuse reflection overcomes that problem. So the viewer can see all of the surface, all of the reflections. So if you take those, that concept of a diffuse reflector and you create a chamber, we call it, that surrounds the part uh, with diffuse reflecting walls, then uh, you'll, you'll be irradiating that part from all directions. The best way to accomplish this is to shine the lamp directly on the wall, not on the part. And that's the key. Is we want the catheters to see only the reflected. We don't want it to see the, the lamp or the bulb itself at all. And uh, when that happens, and these diffuse reflections build up, and uh, you know one wall reflects onto another wall, which reflects onto other walls, eventually you get you know, uniform reflections from all the walls, and the walls become the virtual source of light. From the point of view of the catheter, hanging inside of one of these chambers and is being surrounded by diffuse reflecting walls, no matter where that catheter looks, it sees the same thing, whether it looks to the left or right, up or down, front or back, the view is the same in every direction. And that means that the view is, of course, what I mean then is the view of each molecule, each photo initiator or whatever inside of the coating we're trying to cure is the same, regardless of where it's located on the catheter. And that's true three-dimensional exposure of the parts. Uh, it's a uniform field of light where every point on the surface is being exposed equally and it's being exposed at the same time. Every portion of the catheter sees the same amount of light in terms of power and it sees the same amount of light at every moment in time on every surface. That means we don't need to rotate the catheter. The other thing that it means is that because the chamber walls are the virtual light source, if you want to call it that, we don't have to have a big old bank of, of lamps. You know, we can get by with a single, in many cases we do, with just one lamp that's irradiating four or five foot long catheters, you know, six, 60 inch catheters with a single six inch bulb, as opposed to the conventional method, which would take at least six or 10 bulbs to do that. The, the bottom line of that is that we've improved the coating properties and we've done it in less time since we're not rotating the catheter and starting and stopping and and all of that uh, we're able to do it in less time with fewer lamps and a more uniformly applied light uh, with better uniformly coated results so we got a little uh, cartoon to explain how this works. And, um, you know, we've drawn it here as a, a sphere, but it's a cross section of the sphere. Uh, but uh, it gets the idea across is, um, you know, we have a, a, a sphere here and an opening in it for light to come in. And so we have a ray that comes in. There, there, obviously there are a lot of rays that come in off of a ball. But let's just look at one of them. And that one is diffusely reflected. As we saw before, it shines light in all directions. And each one of those rays that come off of it lands somewhere on the surface. Some of them come out the opening. But let's only look at the ones that land on the chamber surface. And so each one of those rays is diffusely reflected. And so we've just drawn one here, one ray that it's diffusely reflected. And those rays, again, land on the chamber wall or the sphere. And each one of these that lands on the wall is diffusely reflected again. And remember, we're only tracking one ray and one uh, diffuse reflection. And each one of those gets reflected again and again until finally we have uh, a uniform field of light inside the chamber because of all these multiple diffuse reflections. In this cartoon, we, we show an arbitrary part in here that's uh, going to be in the direct view of the, of the light, but for simplicity. In reality, we wouldn't shine the light directly on that part. 
So the question is, why do we want to do that? What's the, the value in this? Uh, first of all, is we have spatial uniformity that all surface seem, surfaces seem the same amount of light. So all surfaces are cured at the same rate. And secondly, we have temporal uniformity, which means there's no self-shadowing, no rotation, no start and stop in the reaction. So the, the curing of the, of the catheter is uniform in both space and in time. We also, because of that, we get better process control. You know, every part on the, every point on the catheter, front and back, all the way around, all the way up and down. And if there are multiple catheters, every one of the ones that are put inside of there see the same amount of light. And so they receive the same amount of energy that's required for curing that, catheter, that coating. And because we have uniformity, we can accurately measure the, the irradiance and the dose on the part itself. That in conventional methods with catheters rotating in front of a bank of light with a complicated uh, uh, field of light, non-uniform field of light in there, it's actually just physically impossible. The laws of physics don't let you measure that light that's actually landing on the part. Plus, you mean you got to think about, well, how much light is landing at what point in time? It just can't be done. But in the Velocure system, uh, you know, with a uniform field of light, then it can be done at every moment in time because it's always the same. And so we have, a, to do this, we have a NIST traceable radiometer that's part of our control system. And it actually measures the dose that's been applied to the coating and terminates the exposure when that target dose is reached. The value of that is in process control. So you know that every catheter inside gets the same amount of light and every set of catheters that get cured, you know, one after the other, every one of those is gonna see the same amount of light. More reasons why this is advantageous is that we can use fewer lamps. And if we're using fewer lamps, we can use higher quality lamps. The typical lamps used in uh, direct irradiation curing are uh, short, you know, roughly six inches or so arc lamps. They really only have a lifetime of about 500 hours. After that, you're down to, you know, you've lost 20, 30 percent of the output of that lamp. So during that 500 hours, the process is unstable. The lamp output is dropping, and so the reaction on the catheters is dropping, and it's going to take longer to cure. But remember in the Vela system, the, with diffuse irradiation, the walls are the light source. And so we uh, can use a single lamp to cure, say, a 60-inch long catheter. But now we can use a much higher quality lamp. And the ones we use from Horaeus Nobelite are microwave energized UV lamps that have a lifetime exceeding 8,000 hours. If you treat it right, It'll, it can last well over 10,000 hours. The other thing is that uh, no direct irradiation means there's less heating. When you're hanging the catheters in front of a, a UV lamp, you're getting the UV off of the lamp, but you're also getting visible light and you're getting the IR light. And it turns out that these lamps radiate, in some cases, radiate more IR than they do UV. And IR will heat that catheter or guide wire. Yeah, which is generally something that's not a good idea to do. Our diffuse reflector doesn't reflect IR. So we shine our lamps on the wall of the chamber, and then it'll reflect the UV in the visible wavelengths, but it won't reflect the IR. And so the field of light that the catheters exist in is largely free of infrared radiation, and therefore the heating is reduced on the catheter. Of course, the UV wavelengths and the visible wavelengths can and are absorbed by the catheter material and the, the coating reaction is exothermic. So there is heating of the catheter, but there's substantially less heating because we've essentially filtered out the IR wavelengths. And another advantage here is this is scal scalable technology and it can be, it's easily integrated into automation. We can do multiple catheters at a time uh, examples we have, uh, you know, doing one at a time, 
or typically for a PTA type catheter, we might do 10 at a time or 15 for our customers. For urinary catheters where throughput is most important due to production, uh, you've got to get the production rate up to get the cost down. Uh, we'll do two, 200 or more per chamber. Uh, so it's, it's extremely scalable and it interfaces easily with the automation required for scale. And then uh, just a quick, this is an overview of a typical configuration for a Velocure system. This, Velocure systems are integrated into a coding and curing machine that our customers specify. And uh, so this is a tip, the typical configuration. It's essentially the chamber is an empty box with a way to get uh, the light in and to get the catheters inside. And so the catheters hang inside, they'll either be in a rack that's supported you know, externally and the catheters will penetrate through openings in the chamber. Uh, and uh, the, cath the chamber might be split along a vertical plane so that it can open and allow a rack of catheters to move in and then close around the catheters. Or for smaller systems, smaller catheters and smaller cure links, we'll have an opening in the top of the chamber with a door and the catheters can drop inside and then the door closes around the catheters. Uh, the, the point is that we, uh, we provide a large opening to allow the catheters to get into place. And then we close around the catheters without touching them so that the light stays inside. The lamps are always on and a shutter, we use a shutter to let the light in and out of the, or I'm sorry, not out. We use a shutter to let the light into the chamber. And then uh, when the target dose is reached, uh, as measured by our, our radiometer, we close the shutter and that terminates the exposure. And then the catheter, I mean, the chamber will either open if it's a split chamber to allow the catheters to move out or the door on the chamber will open to allow the catheters to be pulled out. At that point, we're ready to do another exposure, open the chamber, put the catheters in, close it and begin another exposure. I'd say probably 90%, 90 plus percent of our Velocure systems are integrated into automated, fully automated production lines. And we have a well-controlled protocol for interfacing with the automation. And then again, we have the NIST traceable radiometer to control the exposure so that you always get the same dose every time. But the fun part about that is that the data from that exposure uh, can be uploaded or into the PLC into a data logging system so that the customers or the device manufacturers will have a record of each batch of catheters and the target, the dose that they actually received, the irradiance that they were exposed to, the average irradiance and how long it took uh, to reach that target dose. Uh, that's good for um, both for tracking performance over time and making sure that uh, the system is still performing, uh, you know, as time goes by. And also, if there's an issue with a particular batch of catheters, if that, that batch has been tracked through the manufacturing process, then you can pull up the data and know the exact dose that it reached. Was it the proper amount? Was there some anomaly? Did it take extra long for some reason? And so on. So it could be a very powerful tool for, um, uh, uh, for data log for tracking the data on each catheter or each batch of catheters. And then a little bit about the BW Tech implementation that you'll see in the next presentation. Um, BW Tech has a, a coding and curing machine that, that uh, a Velocure chambers. Right now we're in the process of integrating that into the machine. And I want to talk a little bit about how that's being accomplished from the operators or the customer's point of view. In this case, it's a little different than our conventional systems in that we have a front door, which is akin to, to the split chamber that will open. That front door is actually the front wall, uh, front door of the machine itself. So when the operator opens the machine to the, uh, to the coding system, coding and carrying system, the operator is actually opening the door to the chamber as well. And then that exposes the uh, 
you know, the mechanism for mounting the chamber, the catheters inside of the machine and uh, for making sure that they're aligned and not touching each other and so on. Once that's all set, then the operator closes the door. Now there's a door on the bottom of the chamber as well. And underneath the chamber is the coating station. And in this case, it's some coating tubes. So once the front door is closed and the process is started, the bottom door of the chamber will open and the catheters then will lower down into the coating tubes. And um, then they'll be withdrawn at a precise rate uh, that's used to set the, the thickness and other properties of that coating that uh, BW Tech will talk about next. And as they're pulled out, they're pulled actually being pulled back into the chamber. Once the coating is complete, uh, the and the catheters in their, are in their initial position, the bottom on the chamber, the bottom door will close. That completes the chamber so that all of the light that's introduced from the lamp will bounce around inside the chamber and very little of it will exit. And so at that point, we're ready to start curing. We open the shutter. Uh, our radiometer starts monitoring the uh, accumulated dose. Once the target value is reached, then we close the shutter. At that point, that coating has been cured. But a lot of times you need to have a primer and a top coat. So in that case, once the uh, first coating is completed and cured, the bottom door will open again. The catheters will lower down. But this time, instead of lowering into the primer uh, uh, coating, the tubes on the bottom will have shifted slightly so that now the catheters will lower into tubes that have the top coat on them. And again, they'll be withdrawn at a precise rate back up into the chamber when they're in their initial position. The door closes again, shutter opens, and the top coat cure begins. When the target value is reached, target dose value is reached on that, now the top coat is cured. And in fact, if it's just a two coat process, the catheters are finished. So the door, uh, the operator will be notified that the the, the uh, curing is complete and they can open the door and pull the catheters out and insert the next catheters. So it's a very automated system. It requires manual loading and unloading and that's it. And uh, we can do up to two, well, we can do more than two. We can do one or more uh, rounds of coating and curing. And the parameters for that coating and curing are part of a recipe that uh, will be loaded into the machine. So it's a recipe-based process, which is important because we can do different, the same machine can be used to do different products that may require different uh, uh, coding doses and withdrawal rates and so on. Uh, and if you want to fully automate that, perhaps even the catheters that are loaded can, uh, can be you know, have a barcode or QR code on them that scans them or an RFID on the mounting rack that then lets our system know uh, what recipe to use. And, uh, and they don't have the, the problem, the potential failure point of an operator using the wrong recipe. So I think that uh, pretty well covers our coding technology and our, uh, how we're integrated into the VW Tech coding carrying machine. So thanks for um, listening and uh, we'll take a little bit of time for some questions. And after that, uh, Samuel from VW Tech will explain how all of these things that we've been discussing, the coding chemistry, the curing method, and the uh, dipping and all that, how that's integrated into the VW Tech machine. So let's open it up for questions now, so thanks. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, uh, for that presentation. Mike, we had a couple of uh, questions that came in about the uniformity of the chamber. So the question is, what is the uniformity of the chamber and how do you verify it? Um, typically, it's uh, plus or minus 5% um, from average. And that's, that's uh, about max to min. That's not like a standard deviation or a, a bell curve or anything like that. Uh, we measure that 
using um, one way is by using spectrometers, uh, spectrometer to measure or sample the light that's, that's uh, uh, exiting each wall at different positions. And we'll also hang small little radiometers on the catheters all the way up and down in, in different orientations. So we get a map of the irradiance that's actually seen by the catheter itself. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Mike. And uh, now it's time for me to thank you all the presenters for their expertise. And uh, for everyone attending today, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the materials presented.